This video has been made with the purpose of education and awareness of real crimes and there is no disrespect intended to anyone. This is to help promote truth and justice for anyone who has been a victim of crime. What I'm about to report is what I have researched online and I will welcome any corrections should they be required. Hey there little berries and new breeze, Airy Berry here. I hope you're all well wherever you are watching me from. And um, I just want to say thank you very much for helping me get to over 1300 subscribers. Very, very happy about that. And um, I'd really love to do a lot more and get a lot more videos out to you as much as possible. This particular case uh, takes place in the UK and in Pakistan. I will just give the uh, trigger warnings first of all. This is a case of honour-based abuse and murder, suicide attempt, parental abuse, forced marriage and failures by the authorities to act before it is too late. Just before we do dive into the case, um, I want to just refresh your memories if you've seen a previous video of mine that I did a few years back about the case of Banaz Mahmood. Now, I follow and I have been talking to a lady called Paisy Mahmood on Instagram. She is one of Banaz's sisters who is an advocate and a very prolific person in calling out the dangers of honour-based abuse, FGM, forced marriage, and I believe it was her and other people who were instrumental in getting the government to change the law to ban marriages under the age of 18. A marriage at the age of 17 and under is really a child marriage because you are a child. And Banaz was married off at 17. She had no way of saying no. Also, Paisy herself was uh, in, forced into a marriage when she was 16. She did manage to get out of that and she is free now. But she does so much work out there for people who are victims of honour-based violence, ab abuse and threats of murder. And there are some charities that she has given me names of that I would like to shout out and put links in the description to help anyone out if they have any problem themselves, if they feel that they are going to be forced into a marriage, if they believe that they are in danger of being harmed or even murdered. The charities are Karma Nirvana, Iranian and Kurdish Women's Rights Organization, Forward UK and Savira. And if you also know anybody who you believe may be at this type of risk, please contact them. At, it's best to speak out and help save a life or save abuse, save a person. It's best that people do that rather than letting things go because they don't believe it's any of their business and someone ends up dying or someone ends up being forced into a situation that causes them pain and suffering. We need to talk about this. And there's much more information on those sites as well, as well about the signs that you can look out for and things that people can do to help prevent this type of abuse and forced marriage. I also want to give thanks to my three members, Alf, Denti and Shaz and Candy Ray. Thank you very, very much, guys. I will do more shout outs of members as I, as I as people become members of the channel. If you want to subscribe, please do so. It's free to do. Um, if you want to become a member, it's $2.99 a month, whichever that is in your currency. It will really help me out and I will do some members only posts and videos and give members early access as well as shout outs. And I do consider people who come here regularly and talk to me in the comments my friends because you're just such lovely people. I love talking to you guys feel free to comment. I try and reply to as many as I can, as quick as I can. But anyway, let's get into this case. This is the case of Shafilia Iftikhar Ahmed. Shafilia's parents, Iftikhar and Fasana Ahmed, were first cousins from rural Pakistan who had moved to Warrington in Manchester in the mid 80s. Warrington has a prominent and well-established Muslim community and the people within it are very tight-knit, they are in close contact, they look out for each other. The actions of one family member has a very close uh, impact on the reputational uh, uh, reputation of the rest of the wider family. In one documentary I saw, there was something very powerful that was said is, we're all familiar with the term blood is thicker than water, but in some places the term honour is thicker than blood. Now this term honour is really not the right type of word. But in this case, it means people having to be honorable to a family code. And if they violate that code, there are consequences. And it is unfairly apportioned to the women in these communities 
to follow strict rules and if they don't follow these rules then they have brought shame on the family and they are the ones who suffer the consequences and these are even actions that the women had no will to or no want or intention of doing even rape a woman is sometimes seen as being responsible for what happened to her she's the one who's caused disgrace so she's the one who is murdered or harmed what a woman wears what a uh, who, with whom a woman conducts her day-to-day -day life such as conversations just talking to a member of the opposite sex who is not her husband or family member can bring shame leaving a husband being unfaithful to a husband it's got nothing to do with religion nothing whatsoever it is to do with culture it's to do with traditional and very 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 conservative impacts on people's lives. It's absolutely nothing to do with Islam, it is nothing to do with Hinduism, Sikhism. However, it does occur a lot within the Asian communities, mostly South Asian communities. But when you're living in a country like the UK where we're very liberal, we're very tolerant, people can have any faith they want. However, the culture in the UK is that people are usually free to do and say what they want because everyone is born, although into a family under which they are um, protected until they are 18 legally, as soon as you are old enough, you have the right to live your life on your terms. Nobody has the right to coercively control you, and that is actually a criminal offence now, coercive control. Nobody has the right to assault you. Nobody has the right to force you into a marriage. Nobody has the right to tell you what you should and shouldn't wear or who you shouldn't shouldn't, shouldn't talk to. Freedom of religion, freedom from religion, freedom of career choice, freedom to have children or not have children. Now I'm very privileged that I was born into this culture. I feel very privileged that I've been born into that, but there are people who live in the UK who still hold on to the cultures that are not sort of part of the UK culture, where cultures clash and collide. And the children, it mostly in particular the, the females, the, the women, are caught between these two opposing cultures where they're expected to act a certain way by the parents and the family standards. But then in the UK, children have to go to school, don't they? They have to go out and do certain things. They have to abide by certain rules. And if you send a child to a mixed school, and the child is physically in the vicinity of, so if you're, say for example, a girl is in the physical vicinity of boys, she's gonna have to have some sort of interaction with them, like school projects or whatever. They have to sort of be in close proximity in the classroom. They have to sometimes, you know, bounce ideas off each other. But there are some young women like Shafelia who by her parents' standards was forbidden from even talking to boys, even though she went to a mixed school. She couldn't even have friends not within her community, even though she went to a school where there were predominantly or mostly white non-Muslim children. But we digress. Going back a little bit to Shafili's parents, Iftikhar Ahmed was born in the UK, uh, but he had lived for a while in rural Pakistan. I believe it's in the Pujabi area. He was quite happy to live in a Western society, but keeping to his Muslim culture, and that's beautiful. I love that people can take their culture and their religion wherever they want to go, but you do have to be mindful about where you are. And he did, he actually moved from Pakistan to Copenhagen when he was in his early 20s. He moved there and met a Danish woman. He married her. They had both a uh, civil and an Islamic celebration. They lived a very typically Western lifestyle. They were happy and in love and they had a little boy together. Ittikar had no intention whatsoever of leaving his wife or his son. When his son was around two years old, Iftika's family contacted him and asked that he return alone 
to Pakistan as his grandmother was unfortunately dying. When he met with his grandmother, he was told that when he was a child, when he was only like four, I think, or maybe even between four and 10, he was promised to his first cousin, Farzana. They were basically betrothed without their knowledge, without their consent to each other from that young age so that when they grew older, they would be married. Iftikhar had either forgotten this or hadn't known about it or had known about it, but gone away regardless. And Iftikhar's grandmother told him they still expected him to fulfill that promise, despite the fact that he was already legally married and had a son. So his family didn't care nor wish to take into account that Iftikhar had obligations elsewhere. And Fazana could tell that Iftika was not really on board with this. And to be honest, she didn't really want to either, but she knew the consequences of what could happen if she didn't do as instructed. She knew that she would be seen as being the one to bring shame on both of their families, both sides of their families, if Iftika rebuffed her, because she would be the one to be deemed responsible for him rebuffing her. So Fasana threatened that she'd kill herself if Iftika did not marry her. Despite Iftika being happy with his wife, Fasana's threat, his grandmother's words, the pressure from both his and Fasana's side of the family worked and he relented. He agreed to marry Fasana in rural Pakistan. Iftika and Fasana were married and they lived together for two weeks. During that time, they would, they would have been expected and being expected to prove that the marriage had been consummated. Iftikhar didn't tell his wife and son what was happening, but he did manage to make contact with them while he was out there and had arranged for his wife and son to move to Warrington. Now, I have read many conflicting reports of this. It's unclear exactly what Iftikhar's plans were because he really loved his wife and son, but it seems that his time in Pakistan he had not only folded under pressure, but had com had his mind completely reprogrammed. Maybe he expected or wanted both his wives to coexist. He managed to get out of Pakistan and joined his wife in Warrington. I don't know if he actually physically took Fazana with him when he actually went there or whether she turned up later, but I've heard that the latter is more true. Was it a case of Iftikhar was planning on keeping both wives and just biding his time between Warrington and Pakistan? Was he intending to tell his Danish wife? Was he intending to tell his Pakistan wife about the other? Maybe he just married Fazana just to appease her and that he was going to say, right, I'm just gonna leave the country for a little bit and come back. But either way, Fazana did make her way to the UK. And when she made her way to the UK, she was pregnant by Iftika. Iftika's wife from Copenhagen was just devastated. She did not want to share her, her husband. She was just devastated that essentially he cheated on her. So she took her son back to Copenhagen and they divorced privately, never ever seeing each other again, and Iftika had no part whatsoever in his son's life. Iftika did not challenge her on the custody of their son, and this is where it gets really very misogynistic. Iftika said that he was quite happy not to have any part of his son's life because he believed that his son being a male, he would automatically grow up and be as good as he can be, not requiring a father's guidance. But daughters, on the other hand, would need a father's guidance because women are seen as sinful and needing to be completely reprogrammed, sometimes even physically, to toe the line. Iftika and Fazana then set up home together in Bradford. And on the 14th of July, 
Fasana gave birth to the couple's first child, Shafilia. Fasana had been raised in rural Pakistan. She spoke Urdu, she didn't speak English. Iftikhar was fluent in both languages. But Fasana was not acclimated at all to Western culture. She'd never lived in the UK. I don't think she'd ever even been to the UK. And she held the values that had been instilled in her since she was a child from Pakistan. This included the belief that women held full responsibility for the reputation and appearance of the family, and women were seen as being the perpetrators of events, as I've said before, that weren't even their fault. Basically, men were allowed to do as they wanted. Women were the ones who had to conform to a standard. Nazir Afsal, who is an OBE and he's also a very senior person within the CPS, said he once spoke to a man in who was part of this community who described men and women as the following. Men are like a piece of gold. Women are like a piece of silk. But if you drop a piece of gold into mud, you can pick it up and wipe it off and it will still be gold. But if you drop a piece of silk into mud, pick it up and wipe it off, even if you wash it, it's still going to be tainted. Now, I don't really understand that. Tainted in what way? I don't understand how that tainting works. In what sense is someone tainted and who isn't? Whatever, if you've done something bad in your past, you've done something bad in your past. You can't erase that. You need to atone for that. But why this disparity between the genders? I don't get it. Despite Iftikhar previously embracing Western culture, I mean, he even drank alcohol. He went clubbing and pubbing and socializing when he was in Copenhagen. He had apparently been completely brainwashed and his mindset completely changed when he and Fasana agreed that their children would be brought up according to rural Pakistan customs, but situated within a Western country. So it was a culture within a culture where there was a direct clash and the children were caught in that tiny little wedge between the two. It reminds me of a portal to another place or two cultures or two dimensions existing within the same physical space, but them being a disparity between the two. And Iftikhar and Vazana went on to actually have five children. They had four girls and one boy. The first three were girls, Shafilia, Alicia and Mevish. Their fourth was a boy called Junyad, and their fifth was another girl, but she's not been named because she was too young at the time of this incident. Fasana was a housewife. She stayed at home, she did the cooking and the cleaning, she looked after the children, the house was absolutely spotless. Iftikhar worked as a taxi driver, and he did his job, but he was he wasn't very popular among his fellow taxi drivers, he had a temper. He tended to kick off if people didn't have the right change or, um, and sometimes these got physical, but nothing, no consequences ever occurred as a result of it. The four girls shared a room. Junyad, the only boy, had his own room. Now, you could look at that logically and say, okay, fine, brothers and sisters, you often wouldn't keep them in the same room after a certain age. Maybe they would share a room if they were little babies. But having four girls, that was a decade between them in one room, and the boy having his own, that to me is quite unfair because that means he has privacy, the girls do not have privacy. Fazana was militant in that house. Now, a lot of people have said this was Iftika, but Fazana was actually a lot more of a disciplinarian than her husband. They both were, but they were abusive. To their daughters. Junyad, their son, he was spared any of that. When they came in from school, the girls had to change into Asian clothing, even though when they were outside, they would have to wear the school uniform, but they were absolutely told they could not wear skirts, only trousers, and always had to cover up. These beatings were very, very severe, and it wasn't just beatings. There was one incident when Shafilia and Alicia were very, very little. One had thrown a sock, I don't know which one, or at who, or if both were involved. But Fazana made them both stand outside in the cold in their underwear. While they were growing up, Shafilia seemed to receive the most amount of punishment and beatings. There was a chair that she used to sit on in the kitchen. The other kids would watch as one of her parents would hold her, and the other one would beat her. But Shafilia often used to have a cut lip or a bruise on her face or her arms. At one point, 
she had a massive bruise on her neck where her mother had grabbed her by the throat and squeezed so tight that there were so many bruises that they had to, they, well, they felt the need to keep her off school so nobody would, you know, make these inquiries as to what's happening and potentially get social services involved. Shafelia was often locked outside in the cold. Her sisters would often sneak her food because she'd be deprived of food and drink while she was out there. These beatings were over the smallest of transgressions. As I said, a sock being thrown. A very, very trivial thing. She was going to school, but, be, but told she wasn't allowed to have friends, wasn't allowed to talk to boys, had to wear certain clothes. But Shafelia actually really liked Western culture. She liked the music, especially R&B and hip hop music. She dyed her hair at one point and even applied fake nails. Her mother would call her all the disparaging names under the sun just because Shafelia dyed her hair and put on fake nails. When Shafelia put on the fake nails, her mother held her hand down on the kitchen table and ripped the nails off. Another time, Fazana locked Shafelia in the bedroom without food or drink for a few days. Where the daughter slept, I have no idea. But Shafelia was severely abused and she was off school a lot because of this. The parents kept her off school and this didn't go unnoticed by her friends and family. And of course she couldn't have, she wasn't allowed friends even though she did have friends. Her attendance was poor, but whenever Shafelia was in school, she did excellent at her schoolwork. She was bubbly and bright and she was spirited and very, very intelligent. She had aspirations of going on to become a lawyer. She wanted to work hard for it, but her parents keeping her back from school, it made it hard for her to go as far as she could. But either way, she did well when she was there. But the school were concerned that Shafelia was spending so much time away from school. At one point, a teacher called Anna begged the parents to put Shafelia on the phone and eventually Shafelia did come to the phone. And when she did, Shafelia tried to assure the teacher she was okay. But when the teacher says, do I need to be worried about you? Shafelia said, yes. The teachers contacted social services who did make home visits, but the parents managed to persuade social services that everything was okay. But whenever Shafelia did go back to school, that Shafelia had bruises and cuts that were pretty much almost healed, but they, they noticed them nonetheless. And it always happened to be when she came back to school after having time away that this would happen. Shafelia told her friends that she was being beaten almost every day, and sometimes there wasn't even a reason. She was just being beaten, as if being beaten is going to make her do as they want. If anything, it's going to make you not ever want to be there anymore. It makes you want to go away and run away forever. And that's exactly what Shafelia tried to do a number of times. She stockpiled clothing in her locker and took them to her friends. At one point, her sisters managed to get her out of the window of the, of the room, of their room, to a friend's car so that she could run away. And a few times she did run away. But the parents contacted the police and each time she was brought right back to her abusers. This was when Shafelia was around 16 and the parents just found they couldn't control their disrespectful and wayward and wild child, which she absolutely wasn't. It's unrealistic to expect someone so young to behave in a certain way when they don't live in the culture within, you know, you want them to grow up in. It seems extremely not only difficult but impossible to reconcile. If you go to a country and you want to live there or be there for a certain time, you have to understand there's certain things you can and cannot do. Like if I go to America, I'm gonna have to drive on the right. I'm used to driving on the left, but I'm gonna have to drive on the right. There's no two ways about it. I have to do that. Things that I would need to do wherever I go to not break the law or fit in or there's certain things that I can do here that I can't do in another country. But either way, I digress. When Shafelia was 16, she took her rebellion against her parents that one step further, and she got herself a part-time job in a call center. And her parents, mm, no, they didn't like this at all. At one point when Shafelia ran away, she stayed away for quite some time. 
and her parents staked out the school because they thought she must still be attending school. And Iftika found her there and route marched her back to the car, forced her into the car and back home. People described this as almost like a kidnapping, as if, you know, if it wasn't a father and a daughter, that's what it would look like, but nobody could really stop him. Iftika and Fazana didn't forbid Shafilia from having a job, but they insisted on driving her there and back. They also insisted that she gave them her money. They stole £2,000 from her possibly because they didn't want her to get enough money so that she could run away. Shafilia also wrote to the council and begged them for emergency accommodation due to overcrowding, and she said in the letter she was being beaten daily, that one of her parents holds her down while the other one beats her. Nothing was ever done about this. When Shafilia was 16, the parents had enough. They decided to put a drastic plan in action to finally control Shafilia but also make her someone else's problem that they didn't have to deal with her anymore. And part of this was to get her out of the UK and back to Pakistan. They told Shafilia just before she turned 17 that she would be taken to Pakistan and would be married to her 25 year old first cousin, a man she had never met, a man almost a decade older. Shafilia steadfastly refused. She wanted to go far in her life in terms of her career. She wanted to become a lawyer. She wanted to go to university. She didn't want to be married. And she actually physically sat in a chair and refused to move. Somehow, her mother seemed to have a, a bit of a change of heart and she started to be quite soft with Shafilia, making peace with her by offering her a drink. Unknown to Shafilia, Iftika Ahmed had thought maybe getting Shafilia to Pakistan would be a bit of a problem. He'd already gone to his GP and acquired very strong sleeping pills. Fazana had crushed them into a drink. This meant that Shafilia was in such a sedated state that she didn't know what was going on. And by the time she came round from this medicine, she was already on a plane to Pakistan. While she was there, a relative of hers got married and there is video footage online of Shafilia at this wedding. It's very grainy, you can't see a lot. But this is when Shafilia was told that she would be the next to be married. Iftika had actually cancelled Shafilia's return ticket and got a refund and confiscated her passport so she couldn't escape. Their solution was for her to become someone else's problem and be somebody else's responsibility. It would be up to her husband to keep control of her. It would be up to her husband to dictate what she did. Shafilia felt well and truly trapped. And the word trapped is something that she used a lot throughout her life through her poetry. But one of her poems was called I Am Trapped. But here she really was. There was no way out. Shafilia decided that if her parents were going to take drastic action, so was she. Either in an attempt to end her life or at least physically damage herself to the point that nobody would want her as a wife. She took a bottle of bleach and drank half of it. But in Shafilia's case, it didn't kill her. It just severely burned her mouth and throat. And I mean severely. Her attempt, even though it wasn't successful in terms of suicide, it was successful in terms of her not becoming somebody's wife. Her fiance, and I use that term lightly, decided he didn't want Shafilia because she was now damaged goods. Shafilia was taken to a hospital in Pakistan. They treated her as best as she could, but they were limited as to what they could do. Her mouth and throat were so badly burned that she couldn't eat or drink without help. Iftika and Fazana's reaction to this, not concern, not, oh my god, my daughter's hurt, I need to help my daughter. No, they were disgusted by her actions. They were disgusted that their daughter would dare shame them like this. They had no sympathy and no concern for her whatsoever. They believed that Shafilia brought such shame on their family that they, they wanted to leave, but they didn't want to take Shafilia with them. So they left her there in Pakistan with one of her sisters, I'm not sure which, maybe it was Alicia because of the age, but basically she was left there with her extended family. 
and they were the ones left to care for her. It's unclear as to what the parents thought would happen. They weren't there to take care of her, and there was limited health care, and the extended family were left to care for her or deal with her, but maybe they hoped that Shafilia would waste away and die in Pakistan, and they wouldn't have to deal with her, and they could just tell the people back home in Warrington that she was married out there, and maybe died out there, and that was that. It sounds abhorrent to say, but that's a possibility that that's what they were hoping. The extended family were very concerned about Shafilia. She had lost so much weight because she couldn't eat very well. She couldn't even control her saliva. She was constantly salivating down her face. They weren't prepared to see Shafilia die and they contacted Iftikhar and Fasana in the UK and said, you need to bring your daughter home. She needs serious care. You know, we think she's dying and we don't want that to happen. Iftikhar relented and he returned to Pakistan bringing his daughter back with him. She was so ill that as soon as she got off the plane, didn't go home, she went straight to hospital. She underwent surgical procedures to help repair some of the damaged tissue in her throat. She was on various medications for the damage caused by the bleach and was in hospital for eight weeks. Some sources I've read say that one of the parents kept constant vigil by her side and would not let her be alone. Others said that she had no visitors at all, all the time that she was in hospital. Now, hospitals have visiting hours, and in, on some occasions, if someone is really ill, they will often bend those rules, but they can't have someone there all the time because they often have to carry out checks, etc. But somebody once pointed out this was a way of making sure she didn't she didn't talk, making sure she didn't tell the truth about what she did. Now, the story that Shafilia had told medical authorities in both Pakistan and the UK, which I'm pretty sure her father and her mother told her to say, again, that there are some conflicting stories. The first one I read was that in a power cut in Pakistan, she went to get a drink of orange juice and accidentally drank a bottle of bleach or half a bottle of bleach. And in another one, which was actually in a televised interview, Ittika said she took it because she thought it was a mouthwash. What? Bleach is a caustic and corrosive, very strong smelling substance. If it's near you, you wince. It gets into your eyes. It's never kept near juice or mouthwash. And if it is, you'd know the difference as soon as you unscrew the cap and bring it to your face. Nobody would mistake a bottle of bleach for juice or mouthwash without knowing. As soon as they put it to their lips, this was something that was burning. You don't swallow mouthwash. And if it were orange juice and you swigged it back, you would, you would certainly not drink half a bottle of it. <laughs> and mouthwash can feel very, you know, very, very tingly, especially really strong mouthwash. But even then, you'd react straight away and spit it out and you wouldn't swallow it. But to swallow bleach in that quantity, this was deliberate. Shafilia never told a different story, but it was very clear that, you know, this had happened. But the hospital staff, nobody ever contact, contacted any authorities to say they were concerned about this young woman. By this point, she was just turning 17 or had just turned 17. After weeks of being in hospital and a couple of months after that, Shafilia was starting to recover. She still needed medication and uh, she had to go to the, to the doctors and to the pharmacy regularly to get her medication. Got her job back at the, um, at the call center. She'd been out of the country for a while. She hadn't continued with her A-levels, so she was planning on restarting her A-levels in the September that year, which was 2003. The parents were concerned that Shafilia was just going right back to how she was before. How on earth could they resolve this? They couldn't have her married off again. I think what they probably could have done was waited till she was 18 and said, right, off you go. But it seems that they were not willing to wait that long. One day when Shafilia finished work at the call center, her parents went to collect her, and Fazana, she was not happy. Fazana saw that her daughter 
was wearing a t-shirt, so her arms were exposed, and she was wearing tight black trousers, which in itself was not a problem, but she was wearing white stilettos. Absolute no-no. A massive argument ensued in the car, and Fazana kept demanding to see inside of Shafilia's handbag and check her phone. Shafilia would not let her mother check. When they got home, they were still arguing, and the children were there, the, the, brothers, the brother and the sisters were there, witnessing the escalation of this argument. And Shafilia was once again put into the chair and beaten. Shafilia restarted her A-levels, but like what happened before she went away, Shafilia stopped attending. Now, normally, if Shafilia had run away, the parents would contact the police. When the school contacted Iftika and Fazana, and they told the school that she had ran away, this didn't seem right, because whenever Shafilia had run away before, the parents had always contacted the police, but on this occasion, they didn't. Very strange. So the school contacted the police and reported Shafilia missing. The police went to speak to Iftika and Fazana, who both said she's probably with her boyfriend. Boyfriends were an absolute no-no, not even friends of boys. Shafilia's sisters and brother also said she's probably just ran away, but the parents did not want Shafilia's name out there, did not want any reports or to take part in any investigation or pre press conferences because they felt that news of a missing child would bring shame on them. What struck the police as odd was also was that the photos in the house of Shafilia had all been taken down, so there were no photos in the house depicting her. There was no sign her friends hadn't seen her. There was no boyfriend as far as people knew. I have seen in some sources she had a boyfriend, but I've not seen that in many sources. Nobody knew where she was. And with the parents being so uncooperative, it was so difficult to try and look for this missing 17-year-old girl. Posters were eventually put up for her because I thought, well, we have to, we have to do this. In an attempt to try and get more of a response from the Muslim community, if they knew anything, the actress Shobna Gulati, uh, she played Sunita in Coronation Street, read Shafilia's poetry at a press conference. Shafilia's medical records were monitored. She had not gone and collected any of her medicines that she needed for her throat either, so wherever she was, she would need this medicine, she would be in danger. This, along with the wall of silence from everybody that knew her and those that were concerned about her, her school friends didn't know anything. The police began to suspect that Shafilia had been the victim of an honor killing. They managed to bug the home and the family mostly spoke, spoke in Urdu, they had it translated. And there were some suspicious things said, but nothing outright about what happened to Shafilia. The children were basically told not to say anything, but it wasn't clear what they were talking about. It seemed as if the, the Armoureds were forensically aware or knew that the house had been bugged, so they were careful not to say anything. They talked about some forensic evidence in the car, but again, not clear what it was. The parents actually did say to the press that although they did find her a suitor in Pakistan, she was free to make her own choices and absolutely no, she was not forced into a marriage and that they encouraged their daughters to live their life on their terms. For months, people looked for Shafilia and at one point, people believed that they found her, that she had gone into a pharmacist, I believe in, I believe in Scotland. Her parents were shown the CCTV footage of the girl in the pharmacy and the parents said, yes, that was her, that was Shafilia. She was clearly alive and going into the pharmacy to get medication. But the police were not convinced and they showed that footage to many other people and they said, no, that was not Shafilia. The young woman on the CCTV was found and it turned out she was just looking for the morning after pill. No prescription was filed, nothing like that. This person was definitely not Shafilia. She was still a missing person. 
In February 2004, the body of a young woman was found in the River Kent in Sedgwick, Cumbria. This was around 60 to 70 miles away from the armoured household. The body appeared to have been either dismembered, but could have been dislodged from water activity because it was found basically on a bank of the river, wrapped in a blanket, although some parts of the body, including the hands, could be visible. And the person who found her thought that he was looking at butcher's meat. This was clearly a human body, but it was so decomposed beyond recognition. There was a bit of miscommunication between the pathologists and the police. At first, they didn't believe that the body was Shafilia because they were told that the person was a white female. But it turned out they didn't say she was a white female, they just said she wasn't black. So she could have been Asian. They tested the body using DNA and dental records because the fingerprints were beyond, you know, they were so badly decomposed and physically she was not recognisable. But the DNA and the dental records showed that the body, body was that of 17 year old Shafilia Ahmed. There's no way that somebody could just die and end up wrapped in blankets and bin bags on the banks of a river. This was deliberate, this was homicide, quite clearly. But it wasn't clear exactly how Shafilia had died. There was no visible injuries they could see. As I said, it seemed that she had been dismembered, but this was this was post-mortem. This hadn't this hadn't been her cause of death it's more than likely that it was due to something that you physically couldn't see, such as asphyxiation. Strangulation you normally can see because of the bone that is usually um, affected, but this wasn't the case here. They believe the body had been there all this time and hadn't been moved. This was a very remote place, a place that not many people go to, let alone you know, frequent, you know, it's right in the middle of the Lake District. Some say that even not all of her body parts were found. That's how in little pieces she was and not everything was wrapped in this bundle. But there was enough of her, of course, that they could determine this was Shafilia. The, the ring and the bracelet that she was wearing was still on her person. As soon as they made the determination that this was Shafilia, Iftika and Fazana were arrested and five other members of the extended family were also arrested, but they were released without charge because there was no evidence to positively charge them or enough to secure a conviction. But it was interesting to note in the police's interviews and in any of the press conferences, Iftika and Vazana barely, if any, any time used Shafilia's name. They called her the daughter or the girl. They spoke of her in very sort of not very personable terms. They didn't speak highly of her. They didn't talk about what she was like. They did say, you know, she wanted to make something of herself. You know, she wanted to go on to university and yes, we would have supported that. But it, they didn't seem really to be that devastated by the loss of the first child. Shafilia's poetry was very telling as well. She clearly said in her poems that she wanted to please her parents. She wanted to do right by her community and her culture and her religion and everything, but she also wanted to live her own life. She felt trapped in this small, tight, I mean, it's not even a, an area, but she was, she was basically put between two boards and it was so painful and tra and she felt so trapped. These poems were very powerful. There was no forensic evidence to confirm that Iftika and Fasana had been responsible for what happened to their daughter or these extended family members, so there was nothing further that could be done. And the police believed that what they needed to wait for was something to happen. These The children, they even interviewed the children who said they didn't know what happened. They suspected the children knew more than they were letting on. They were being a bit cagey, but they knew that the children were fearful of the parents. And what they needed was one of those children to break ranks. Over the next few years, the police tried very, very hard to be able to secure something. They didn't let this case go. And in January 2008, a press conference was held and the Ahmeds steadfastly did not want anything to do with this inquest. Even though Shafilia's death had been ruled unlawful killing, the parents tried very hard to have this overturned. They didn't agree that this was an unlawful killing, but their attempts were unsuccessful. 
I'm not quite sure why they did that, because they didn't know, apparently, what had happened to her. So they were trying to get it changed, possibly, so there would be no chance whatsoever of them being even investigated. At this inquest, even though the armoured said they didn't want to take part, they did. They walked in halfway through the inquest with their lawyer and vehemently denied having anything to do with their daughter's death and even accusing the police of cultural racism. They said they were the victims. Nothing about Shafilia. They said that they were the victims of racial hatred and this was all this was about. That something had happened to their daughter, they didn't know what, but the police were targeting them unnecessarily. Six years after Shafilia's body was found, something very, very unusual happened. Alicia Ahmed had broken away from the family. She had managed to get herself to university. She wasn't forced into a marriage. I'm not sure how that was managed. I don't, I don't quite know what had gone on there. But I believe at some point she had cut ties with her parents, but then reconciled. She was home for a weekend and Alicia was in a massive financial mess. Now, she said years later this was her parents doing, that they had stolen money from her and she was trying to get it back. Alicia had arranged with some of her friends at university to break into her parents' house, stage a break-in and steal jewellery, cash, whatever they could in an attempt to get some money back for her. This attempted burglary didn't go down too well. It wasn't a professional burglary, of course. And because Alicia was not tied up, her family was, but she wasn't. Her parents could tell that Alicia was somehow in cahoots with the people coming in. And when the police were called, the parents said, Alicia has done this. Apparently they were not very happy with Alicia because they believed that she was going the same kind of way that Shafilia was. Alicia was taken to the police station and she admitted to what she had done but she said it was to get back the money that she alleges that her parents had stolen from her. And while she was in the police station, she asked to speak to the police off tape about what had happened to her sister. And this is what Alicia Ahmed said. In September 2003, when Shafilia came home after having that argument with Fazana and that she was put in the chair and, and beaten again. This didn't end like it normally would with the beating ending, Shafilia being sent to her room and all of this, or doing her chores. This ended very differently. All four children were watching this happen. Alicia says that either during or after the beating, Fazana said to Iftikhar, Ite katum garu, which means in Urdu, just finish it here. This was a signal to Iftika that they would end their daughter's life. Iftika pinned Shafilia down on the sofa. He put all his weight on her, his knee on her. He instructed either Fazana or Junyad to get a plastic bag. Fazana put the plastic bag into Shafilia's mouth and then covered Shafilia's mouth and her nose with her hand. Shafilia struggled and struggled and struggled. And she even urinated on the sofa, which often happens during asphyxiation. For a whole 10 minutes, the parents held this position until Shafilia stopped struggling and was dead. They wanted to be sure she was definitely dead. And the four siblings watched this at the parents' insistence. After it was over, the parents made those four children swear on the Quran that they would not disclose any of what they'd seen. They wrapped Shafilia in blankets and bin bags, put her body into Iftika's taxi. He drove to Cumbria and dumped her in the lake. Now, Iftika had previously, way before Shafilia's disappearance had remarked to somebody at his work that if he were to plan the perfect murder, he would dump the body in the Lake District 
because that is where nobody would look. What was also odd was that when the police were doing their initial investigations, they tried to look at um, Iftika's record, his taxi record, but he deleted it, his meter, so they could see where he'd gone. And normally that wouldn't happen. That was, these circumstantial pieces of evidence were not strong enough at the time but now that they had Alicia's testimony, they could bring this to court. The problem though, was that Alicia had a grudge against her parents because of, you know, th that she had staged this robbery. You know, she didn't want to live that li a life with them anymore. She wanted to make something of herself. She alleged they stole money from her. So the defense could potentially argue successfully that Alicia was lying. When this went to court, a young woman from the same Muslim community came forward. She was the former best friend of Alicia's younger sister, Mevish. Uh, Mevish, I believe, was about 12 or 13 at the time of Shafilia's death. Mevish had told her friend that something had happened that she couldn't talk about. So her friend said, write it down and tell me, and went out with her mum one night, one day in a, in town, with the friend not meeting up with them, but following behind, and Mevish dropped the paper on the floor, and her friend picked it up, and in this, she wrote what had happened to Shafilia, and even said things like, why didn't we intervene, why didn't we do something? Mevish even said that she was beaten because she saw the suitcase in which her body had been stuffed apparently. At the time of Alicia giving her evidence, it came to light that it wasn't just Alicia that had broken away from the home. Mevish had done so already, you know, she had tried to move away and live her life, but she had come back and she'd come back and was completely fully compliant with what her parents wanted. She refuted that she ever wrote these things down she had actually successfully got those pieces of paper back from her friend, but just before she was going to give them back, the friend made photocopies and gave these to the police. Mevish denied, absolutely denied, that this was factual. She said this was creative writing, free writing. She was just writing a potential fictional account of what could have happened to her sister. It came out as well in the inquest that Jeunyard was spared the abuse that his sisters received. Ithaca and Fasana Ahmed vehemently deny that they did anything to their daughter. However, after all the evidence was heard, Alicia was give, gave her testimony behind a screen. Fasana spoke with her lawyers. Fasana decided that she would change her story. She didn't admit to killing Shafilia or having any part of it. She said that Ithaca attacked Shafilia. Fasana had tried to defend her daughter Iftika had punched her in the face and Iftika had been the one to kill Shafilia and, and she was so fearful of her husband that she didn't say anything. This kind of sounds plausible. The problem is that Alicia's testimony and many of the other pieces of evidence from the letters showed that Fazana was the more aggressive one of the two and the taped uh, you know, from the from the bugs that were put into the home showed that Fazana was definitely not fearful of her husband. She was a very strong, strong character. Iftika and Fazana were both found guilty of murder and they were sentenced to life with a minimum term of 25 years. Fazana said nothing. She had no reaction whatsoever, but Iftika swore at the police. From what I have read, um, Alicia has gone into witness protection. She's very frightened for her own safety. She's spoken out against her parents. She's spoken out against her community. Uh, Mevish stands by her mother and her father. She sees them still. She says that they're innocent, even though there's evidence that she was there. And it came out that Junyad said that Shafilia deserved what she got. He believes she deserved what she got. Now, I don't know if that was just him talking at the time. I believe he was around seven, or n seven or n between seven and nine, that he was so young that he had that mindset instilled in him. I don't know what his view is like now, 
but he still stands by his dad as far as I know. I, I don't know about the younger sister, she's never been named. I hope wherever Alicia is, she is doing well. We all deserve autonomy, we all deserve freedom, and it's understandable that your parents may want you to do certain things, but once you have children, even though they are technically and legally your responsibility, once they are grown adults, they are their own person in their own right. They, they You cannot keep a rein on them forever, and children are not there for you to look good or for you to make your life better. They're not robots. You can't program them. You can try and get them to follow the path that you want if you want them to, but if they don't want to, don't kill them. Don't kill them. That is absolutely not the right thing to do. And these parents knew that it was wrong. They knew it was wrong to beat and abuse their children. They knew it was wrong to kill their daughter because they tried to cover it up. If you really feel that your child has dishonored your family and it's there's no going back, please do not kill them. I would rather a child be disowned than be killed because at least they can live their life. It may be hard for them, but there is help out there. Break away if you can. These parents should have been proud of their daughter. She did her chores like she was told and quite often she had to do her chores before going to school or before doing her homework. She tried her best to please her parents, but at the same time, the outside world was beckoning. Karma and Havana have a memorial day or memory day for honor victims, which actually has been set as the 14th of July, which is Shafilia Ahmed's birthday. That is the, the day they celebrate victims of honor-based abuse. And I would very much encourage you to visit the sites, learn what you can, donate if you can, and even if you can't, please, just look at this and see if there's any way that you can help indeed if not in donation and i am so sorry to anyone out there who is being abused or has been pressured into living a life that they really don't want to live there are ways out it's dangerous i know but there are places like karma nirvana that can help you and please go and follow paisy mahmood she gave a ted talk uh, some time ago she is an absolute hero for what she has done for it for honor-based abuse victims and also for keeping the memory of her sister alive and I have the utmost respect for her at some point I want to go and visit Benaz's grave um I, I really do feel like I should thank you so much for watching my lovely little berries I adore you all please join the channel if you can stay safe wherever you are and I'll see you in the next video bye bye Mwah.